You are listening to More Human, the show where we share the stories that encourage leaders to make their businesses and organizations more human. I'm your host, Jeremy Newlick. So let's begin with the podcast equivalent of Would You Rather? Scenario one, you are meeting a friend for coffee. She arrives to the cafe and you remember that she likes her coffee with some sweetener. So you take a couple of sugar cubes and you drop them in. Now, little did you know that the cubes have been laced with cyanide. And moments later, your friend with a sweet tooth, she drops dead. It's a hell of a way to start a podcast. Don't worry. It only gets darker. Scenario two, you're meeting a friend for coffee. However, both the coffee and the friendship are a ruse. You hate this person. You bring sugar cubes laced with cyanide to the cafe and you drop a couple of them into the coffee. However, your so-called friend finishes her coffee and the painful conversation. She gets up and she leaves. She lives out the rest of her days unaware of her close call with death. Now, here is your question. In which of the previous scenarios are you more morally corrupt? Almost every neurotypical human would answer scenario two, the one in which you intended to kill your friend. That's the one that's more corrupt. It seems obvious. I mean, murder runs against everything in your value system. At least I hope it does. But what if there's a lens through which you would unequivocally believe that the first scenario is the more morally corrupt choice? I mean, after all, in that scenario, your supposed friend is dead. The outcome would lead you to believe that it is far more, for lack of a better term, wrong. Ian McGilchrist presented ethical dilemmas like this one and other tests to a number of subjects over the course of several years. The psychiatrist and author of The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, was re-examining a question that has fallen out of favor with most people who study cognition. That question is, why do we have two hemispheres to our brain? Are we really of two different minds? So to answer the question, he studied a large number of humans who've had damage to either hemisphere of their brain or the removal of the corpus callosum. That's the part of the brain that separates the left and the right hemisphere. Essentially, what he found was this. The left brain deals largely with the tactile or tangible. It is focused on what is immediately available. It's concerned with what tasks can be completed. The right brain deals mostly with the abstract. Most of its processes are not easily articulable. It is responsible for giving context and meaning to the things that are happening in the left hemisphere. So more simply put, the left brain sees a tree, the right brain unpacks an understanding of the concept of forest. So that scenario that started the podcast, the one with your friend and the coffee, McGilchrist found that the people who had damage to their right brain or they had suppressed their right hemisphere, they were much more likely to be outcomes focused. So intentions did not matter the most tangible and obvious results are all that matter. And so thus, when thinking only with the left brain, the first scenario with good intentions and a dead friend is the morally wrong scenario. Now here's the scary part. According to McGilchrist, we live in an increasingly left brain world, a world that is characterized by the tangible. Now you can see this all around you, in particular in business. We are bottom line, outcomes focused. And as such, our models for how we solve problems in business look an awful lot like machine type of solutions. Our systems we create focus on outcomes and deal with the known, rather than taking an exploration into the things that are unseeable and less articulable. Now the trouble, of course, in this kind of mindset is that we have lost a good portion of our humanity, the attributes that make us less like machines. In a recent Harvard Business Review article, Allison Reynolds and David Lewis refer to this phenomenon as the tyranny of the tangible. Business leaders are forced into situations where outcomes must be quickly measured. And this approach is the reason why a majority of change initiatives fail, 
and can even result in company closures. And when they were surveyed, leaders said that while they knew that the intangible or human components of change were critical, they'd rather not focus on them. It's messy. It's hard. On our show today, we have a couple of people who are experts at navigating the messy or human parts of, well, humans. They offer a framework for that unknown or imaginal space. The first guest, Richard Olivier, and I've been running an organization for the past 20 years that calls itself Mythodrama, that works with uh, lessons from theater and archetypal psychology to develop leaders to their full potential. And it's worth mentioning that he's the son of the famed British actor, Sir Lawrence Olivier. And not to confuse first names, but the other voice you're going to hear is... Lawrence Hillman, and I am a consultant. I work with companies, with people, with personal growth, and with corporate awakening, if you want. It is also worth mentioning that Lawrence is the son of James Hillman, who studied with the famous Carl Jung and founded Archetypal Psychology. Now, by the way, if you don't know what archetypes are or archetypal psychology, hold on, we're going to get into that in a moment. Now, these two sons of genius, who are geniuses in their own right, met while working together on a transformation strategy at the Globe Theater, where they blended the notions of leadership and narrative within Shakespeare and Jungian insights on astrology and the power of archetypes. Now, the result is a framework that helps us to create a scaffolding for describing the parts of human cognition that are harder to define. They're not tangible or always visible. And yet, they're alive, and we know them. Richard begins our conversation by letting us know why, in the midst of our left-brain world, the disciplines like the theater, arts, and archetypes are more critical now than ever for leaders. I think an idea that theater and the arts bring a depth and another perspective to bear on both on personal and professional development and that images and uh, archetypes the, the the idea of characters and and being um, the leading actor on your stage as a leader being the chief storyteller in your organization if you're a leader, those kind of images, uh, I think, are probably not the, the first things that people normally think about when they think about being a successful leader. But we find they are the almost quintessential human attributes that make leadership uh, memorable and effective. A lot of leaders may see that as some touchy-feely stuff. You know, like they've got stuff they have to accomplish. They've got tasks they must attend to. How do you how do you approach a CEO when he says, "Yeah, all well, that may be true," and uh, but tell me how that relates to the things I have to get done every day? So, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. I think that the world is getting increasingly complex. I think that's pretty. Everybody would probably agree with that on most levels. And in this complexity some of the skill sets that have worked in the past, for instance, the direct thinking as a leader of command and control or, you know, problem solving using X to solve Y because it's been done before, all these things are just not enough. And there's something that has been missing that has been sort of pushed away, which we could also very broadly call right brain thinking, which is, you know, the, the imaginal, the artistic, the dreamy, the intuitive, the non-rational, all these pieces that are quite important to solve complexity. I remember talking to a, a, an F-16 pilot um, about this because the complexity of what they do when they're flying almost Mach 1, um, you know, three-dimensional thinking, being chased by two MiGs, let's say, in an exercise, and they have um, you know, a very dangerous weapon system at their fingertips, it's not enough to think linear. You can't think, well, when this happens, I have to do that. They just can't. They have to think you know, with a complex um, whole brain kind of approach. And it seems that in the problems that we have today, if we want to solve what we have, we have to use the whole brain. So this is about bringing forth um, what we could call, you know, right brain skills that have just been pushed away. Richard, when did you see, 
you know, the, 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 the things that you glean from being in, and forgive me, the, the family business of theater and acting and everything, when did you first see that that could be applied to business leadership questions? What was the way that you saw a, a way in? Um, we were actually did a, a live experiment. I mean, I learned most by kind of doing labs, you know, trying stuff out. Uh, it's hard to apply this stuff theoretically without the practice because it is about getting on your feet and doing things differently. So I was directing a wonderful actor called Mark Rylance in the play of Henry V for the opening of Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in London in 1997. And we wanted to see if the leadership lessons that we thought existed in this 400-year-old play were relevant for modern leaders. So we got a group of 12 public sector leaders into a rehearsal room, locked the door, and took them through the play for two days, just literally saying, do you do this? Do you need to do this? Is it easy for you to do this? Is this relevant? About all the stages that Henry V was doing about building consent, selling a vision, dealing with traitors taking the first steps, managing the first blocks, surviving the long dark night of the soul, and finally turning the battlefield into a garden. And, and at the end of this two days, you know, we said, okay, so what's relevant and what's irrelevant? And they said to us, everything that Henry V does in this 400-year-old play is relevant to my modern leadership. Um, Interesting, so human beings 400 years ago in very much the same sort of circumstances as from a leadership perspective? Yeah, under, understood the, the essential behaviors, the being of leadership that, that was essential for success. You know, the doing, the strategies are going to change age to age, but the, the fundamental essence, the fact that who you are shows up in what you do, that's true in every age. Interesting. So you saw, ah, there's an in here, there's, a, there's an inroad I can make uh, using the great works, using... Uh, the arts as a way to talk about leadership. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the other impetus for me personally was that I've been working uh, in the field of men's development and personal potential movement. And uh, one of the things that struck me was how many people I was meeting who were being damaged by their organization. So here were people who were kind of felt used up and thrown away. And this in the early 90s when there was a mini recession in, in UK and Europe. And I got interested in working upstream. So, okay, we, we know how to patch up the walking wounded, but if we could actually get upstream and work with the people who are making those decisions, maybe, you know, we could make the world a bit better. And, and Lawrence, for you, when did you see that sort of archetypal thinking could be applied and and what is it that knits you into into what what Richard's discussing well like Richard I also come from if you want a family business as my father James Hillman is the originator of archetypal psychology so someone once said I was marinated in the in that kind of thinking and and for 40 years I've been practicing and learning and and imagining and experimenting with different ways of expressing archetypes um, and tell us just really quickly what archetypes <coughs> are, just for any listener who may, may not have a familiarity. They're universal patterns, experiences that we all have. So, for instance, the trickster is an archetype, appears in every mythology and every culture all over the world um, in different forms, sometimes as a shapeshifter, sometimes as a thief, sometimes as a traveler, sometimes as a juggler, sometimes as a magician. But this figure, this archetype, has different names, Loki, um, uh, in the Norse uh, tradition, it has um, the roadrunner in the southwest and these kind of images, different ways of, of being a trickster, lots of it in cartoons, of course. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, so, so it's been an, a, a natural part of my life for 40 years is to think in this way, and I'm applying it in different ways. Currently, I'm applying it in the corporate world to see how we can help leaders to adjust with the complexities that, that exist for them. Can you give me an example, either of you or both of you together, of some of the, the ways in which this has shown up in the business world? So what was, a, was there a CEO or a business leader who had an issue or some group you got called into and you guys were able to transform their mindset or their way of thinking about, about the issue? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think on a, on a minor level, me and the the guys in my company would do that, you know, would, would feel like they want to be doing that every day. I can give you a kind of topical example would be a, a global mining company. Um, the, the CEO uh, saw me talk about Henry V at Davos, the World Economic Forum. Um, about six months later, we got a call from his HR director. Uh, uh, and they said, we want our top 100 people to, to go through a program because our CEO recognizes that the way we're currently doing business is not sustainable, um, that we are polluting a lot of the countries that we work in. We are not turning the, the battlefield into a garden. If anything, we're turning the garden into a battlefield. Right. And we want to stop. Um, and, and we work with them. We still do some work with them today. This was about uh, 10 years ago. Um, and, and we take them through uh, uh, an experience, a physical experience that includes what we would call an archetypal immersion, where they diagnose their current archetypes and look at what is it I'm not currently activating in my leadership um, that, that could make me a better leader, that could make me better able to enable this shift that the CEO now wants us to do in, in, in the culture and in the company. And, um, you know, for me, the great news was two years ago, I went back to work with the uh, executive team and uh, they put the, a little chart up and their recycling business is now their biggest profit center in the entire organization. Really? And when I first worked with them 10 years ago, it was, you know, the poor cousin who everyone was wondering, why the hell are we getting into this stuff? So, you know, cultures can change. They do change. Um, the world is requiring cultures to change more quickly, more rapidly, to become kind of future fit in, in, in quicker stages than it ever has before. And the leaders and, and the leadership cultures who, who embrace this um, need for, for cultural transformation will be the ones who, who have the most staying power, I have no doubt. Is it fair to say then that what you're saying is that the archetypes, archetypal thinking, and, and the kinds of uh, understanding of leadership that's been presented to us through, through tools like Shakespeare, through examples like Henry V, that that offers us a language that's, that's human and that's transcendental to culture to a degree at least. And, and what it does is it, it allows for uh, change to take place on a, on a level that is that transcends, you know, mostly the, the the sort of other tactics that we tend to have when we try to go through change, which is another layer of management, sort of artifice that we pile on top of the stuff that we're already trying to do. I mean, I don't I don't know if I'm characterizing it the right way. So you tell me why you think it's it's really effective at being transformational. I think it's a language, and I think it's a language that's very useful because it is so broad and so imaginal. Again, it's a very very good language for the right brain. So things aren't literal. We're so used to thinking literal, we've sort of lost that capacity. And, and thinking archetypally allows us to think in a more Im you know, imaginal sort of way, which opens up the mind to possibilities we might not have seen. So for instance, I'll give you a practical example. <coughs> um, a, a case in, in, in my case, a client came, also non -con you know, confidentiality, of course, I have as well. And so, but a client came, you know, first as an astrology client, just to know more about themselves and the issues they were facing, and then turned out into a uh, consulting uh, work and and um, the, uh, to understand leadership in 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 this person as an archetypal story allowed for all kinds of sort of literal problems like how do I deal with this how do I deal with that seeing it, seeing it as a story almost like a fairy tale or almost like a a myth or almost like a, the the hero's journey of some kind made that story plausible and things that, that stood up in front of this person as a problem became archetypal stories you could then play with and imagine to change what would the hero do in the journey, what would happen here. And so it became, but because we're thinking archetypal, it's not literal. It's not, well, this person is mean because they're in my way. It is this person is representing that part of me that I have a hard time relating to and I can see this from my own personality. And so this is really something I want to learn. So this person is going to show up again and again. Maybe it'll show up in my, as my spouse or as my kid or as my or as my my enemy or the cop that leans through my door uh, when I'm going too fast these kind of things these people these 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 archetypal impersonations 
in other words, people who represent the archetypes will keep showing up until I learn the archetype, for instance, as an example. So if I recognize what these different characters have in common on an archetypal level, that the cop and, the <coughs> and, and, and all these other people that are in my way, for instance, you know, they keep showing up, that they're trying to show me something and that I can learn from that, and then that no longer has to be an issue in that way. Interesting. So it, it's, it, it really is about understanding that you're on a journey, that you're on a narrative uh, that, is, that is perhaps <coughs> bigger or not as obvious as what you would see in the literal sort of world. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that right? Yeah, and that you're not made up by your history. You're made up by something much richer. Hmm. It's not just, well, I was born here and I had these opportunities. I went to this school. That that's, that's who I am. But you are an archetypal story, which in my case I look at through the astrological chart, which gives me the story. <laughs> but it's much richer than that. It's, okay, so here's how these characters have shown up in my life. And it makes it a story of imagination. So I can start filling in the pieces. Well, that makes sense. Here's that pattern. Here's a pattern I'm missing. This is why this keeps showing up that way and so on. There are rational reasons to be cynical of the elements that Richard and Lawrence draw from. I mean, if you're anything like me, you're skeptical of people who would suggest that you can learn something of, of my personality because you know the position of the sun and Venus at the moment I was born. But rather than seeing astrology or the arts as belief systems, Richard and Lawrence both hold that what's offered is a framework, a useful language for describing meaningful human experiences. And that's what Richard hopes most leaders take away with them when they explore myth and archetypes. That development is possible, that uh, the change that's coming towards all of us is not going to be manageable with the way we used to do things in the 20th, 20th century, and that this kind of exploration of 21st century leadership, for want of a better word, is going to be the key to not only their individual survival, but on a global level, our collective survival of the 21st century. And, and man would be to, to risk, you know, dipping a toe into parts of, of, of reality that, that they may either be fearful of or were told when they were kids, that's just your imagination, you know, that's not real, and these kind of things. And today that's what we look for in employees, that we want creativity and people who are not just stuck in one ability and capability and so on. And so, you know, to take a chance and to just learn, find out about some other things that are out there, and they don't have to agree with it, they don't have to adopt it, they have to, you know, they don't have to do anything with it. But before they get before leaders get to a point or anybody coming there gets to a point where I'm now stuck and I have no choice but to, you know, radically change or <clears throat> jump off a cliff or do something horrible, why not learn about other ways that are out there, um, strange things to them, you know, why music might be important or David White who reads poetry in organizations or, or gee, astrology, you know, things that are out there that, that make no sense at all at first call. But with a little bit of information, one finds, wow, there's some, there's some, there's some tools there that I never thought about that could actually help my company a lot. Uh, Einstein had a lovely quote apparently above his desk at, at Princeton that said, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. Mm -hmm. So you're hoping that people walk away with understanding that, that there's more to it, there's more to the imagination, and that that's actually the the role that they have as a business visionary, as a business leader, there's stuff that is, that's the, not measurable, that's not easily quantified. The, the measurable and the immeasurable go together Both in a new world mm -hmm. and, and there may be a new balance required for future success. Since our recording of this episode, Richard and Lawrence have continued their explorations and their work with business and organizational leaders around the world. They've developed a series of exercises and experiences that are perfect for leaders hoping to run experiments in the application of archetypal narratives. So if you are leading a group of humans through change and you want to know more about archetypal frameworks, you can check out our show notes for links to their books, sites, and resources. Simply find this episode at thehumanproject.org. That's right. We're at .org now. So official. This has been More Human, a production of the Be Human Project. Editing and sound design by Khalees Walker, with art direction by Steph Sabo. It's hosted and written by me, Jeremy Newlick, and we record and produce this thing at our studio at Big Wide Sky 
a human business consultancy. To subscribe to More Human, search for More Human anywhere you subscribe to podcasts. And to learn more about the Be Human Project, or if you love anything you heard today, check out our website, behumanproject.org. And visit often. We love humans.